God bless everybody today. It's July 22nd of 2020 and today we're going to do some updates and I wanted to talk about a couple dreams that I've had and um, potential things I'm seeing happening in the future that might affect us and so I just wanted to go over some of these things. First of all though um, if you've been following any of my teachings, videos, or anything like that, you know that you can find me on Eschatology End of Day Survival at endofdaysurvival.com. If you don't see this page come up, you're probably on someone else's site. Um, so, you know, just realize this is a Wix free site. I don't sell anything on it. I don't. Um, uh, you know, I'm not here to make any money. I'm just trying to change the conversation of the church so that we understand um, to look at things a little differently and to question what the churches have been saying. Um, and these are studies that I've been doing over 50 years. And this most of my stuff is not Main Street in any way, shape, or form. So um, you can agree to disagree with my opinions and my concepts or the images that I've seen. But these are... Um, this is why I do these things and um, so anyway uh, some of the updates I want to talk about um, on this site um, you can go down you can see the mystery Babylon um, article that I put together just recently this has a video that explains why I believe mystery Babylon is Pergamos Turkey or the seat of Satan or Satan's bride and how we have this duality between God and his bride Jerusalem and we have the bride of Satan and how this will end up being the hub of the world that everything radiates out of Turkey that is it's Turkey centristic other than Israel centristic the Antichrist and Satan is uh, Turkey centristic and you talk about this duality of the bride of G of God and the bride of Satan and if you go into this article it goes into a lot of detail in all the different things, connections that I found throughout the Bible. Um, you know, one thing I just added to the Mystery Babylon conversation um, to try to enhance this opinion or this concept is that we talk about this martyrdom, whoever whatever this city is this mystery babylon has to have martyrs of old in it and so that we look at other cities like rome or jerusalem or wherever um and that that because we had martyrdom of uh, people dying for the word of god in old days back in the days of jesus and things like that that because of that it must be these cities but it tells us right here in 212 in this letter to per, uh, Pergamum the seat of Satan um, he tells us a number of things and he says and to the angel of the church of Pergamum he writes I, I have a two sword edge this is the tame two sword edge is Revelation 18 where we have the fifth bull event and he knows where he dwells, that Satan dwells in this place, and that he holds fast as the name that these people, these witnesses from prior, have held his faith within this community, and that they have died, as it shows us here, martyrs of Pergamos, and according to the tradition of the bishop of this place, or the father. So he's talking about the leader, the people that have died, all these martyrs that have died within the city. And I've talked about Pergamos for a while and how it was a huge metropolis and it had uh, coliseums, arenas, and they had games and they had crucifixions and it had one of the largest libraries, second largest this library in the region and how it had over 200,000 manuscripts and books in this library and so it was an evil place in its day and it had a lot of uh, has a lot of uh, history of martyrdom in this place and so I keep bringing this back that is Mystery Babylon, Pergamos Turkey, the seat of Satan and will he bring this city up 
at the end days to be the hub of the world and if you look at all of these different things about the fifth bowl you know you get into uh, Revelation 16 where we talk about the fifth bowl event and he's talking about the destruction of the seed of Satan or the bride and then you go into Isaiah 21 and we're talking about how mystery Babylon has fallen well that's a sixth or a fifth bowl event um, same thing there you look at that it all talks about how mystery Babylon has fallen has fallen well okay we're talking about the fifth bowl event and then if you go into all these other different things how all these things radiate out to make a a concept that no one else seems to understand other than myself that mystery babylon is pergamus turkey this was the fourth image i had it downloaded this information in my head and so i am bringing this concept to you to make you look at it and hopefully we can change this conversation and i've gone into uh, you know this is a fairly long video um it goes into a lot of detail i think it's important that we look at this angle and in hope that we can realize that everything radiates from antichrist to satan everything's going to radiate out of turkey it all comes out of turkey it's all turkey centristic in his world um, the other thing that i've done is i i rewrote this uh three woes and three trumps article which is down on the bottom of the page here um, you can click on this link this link will take you to this article here um, this to me is probably one of the most important warnings in the Bible to us and this warning in Revelation 8 13 goes over about how we should watch these three woes well these three woes are attached to the last three trumpets the fifth the sixth and the seventh trumpet okay and by looking at these last three trumpets with each of them having an attached woe we realize that they can only happen once but they constantly reoccur in what i call the sub chapters and so if you read the 22 chapters of revelation in this manner i believe it makes a complete chronological story with additional layering of three additional visions john has and i break these up so you can see these transitions in this article of, of these three additional visions that he's having in heaven after he's taken up there so if you read the main chapters of 1 through 6 8 through 10 15 and 16 and 20 through 22 you realize that it starts at the beginning of the story of the sorrows or well it starts with John being visited by an angel how he writes seven letters to the churches how then the angel takes him to heaven and then he has a latter-day vision to the end of the book of Revelation okay but there's three additional visions that he's having and I give you these transitions in this article I have not done a video on this because it's extremely complicated I want to make sure I do this in a manner that makes sense but he has three additional visions one of chapter seven of the elect and what they will go through from the time they're selected to the end chapter 11 through 14 and each of these chapters 11 12 13 and 14 are their own little they stand on their own so each of these chapters like 11 just to give you an example are talking about the the temple being measured and how the gentiles and the peoples will trample the city for 1260 days and two witnesses come out and this is what this mainly is about is about the two witnesses of the chapter 11. it talks about the how they're going to prophesy on the temple mount for 1260 days and then abomination will come up and the antichrist will gain strength and they will overcome these two witnesses they'll lay in the street for three and a half days and then we have that shortened half where he takes the remaining away shortly after their resurrection from the street that they've laid in for three and a half days and god tells us not to look back don't grab anything head to the mountains he's mainly talking about israel but he's talking about everybody in general um, get out of this place um, because um, 
the marriage is about to happen and so we can cut these out and so you know and if you look at and i'm not going to go through all these chapters you look at chapter 13 it's all about six trumpet it talks about the beast of the sea rising and then the beast of the earth rising how these two these two beings will basically affect us in the end days and how one is basically a supernatural antichrist and we have a false prophet standing next to him um, and god is allowing michael to literally throw satan out of heaven at that time uh, we're talking about revelation 13 here he's they're thrown out of heaven the angels fall with them and they're cast to earth and then we see this resurrection of a dead gog from the sixth seal into a antichrist supernatural being on the sixth trumpet and i show you that transition there also but if you read these as stand as 14 main chapters in a row as one complete story and then you add these additional visions that feed up to all these different main storyline you'll realize that this is why it's important and i wrote it on the bottom there's a summary of this that this warning is a code which allows us to determine that due to the fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpet with their additional attached woes that occur on these specific verses, oh, I should change that so it's on Revelation 9.13, that, and the seventh trumpet blows on that 15.1 when he hands out the seven trumpets, or the seven bulls, after he sound that seven trumpet, he hands out the seven bulls to the seven angels, um, these transitions happen for a reason. They can only happen once in the main storyline or the main 14 chapters, but they're constantly reoccurring in those sub chapters. And that's why. Why? Why is he saying that? Because we know that the fifth trumpet and the first attached woe is when Michael is standing on the bottomless pit and it opens up, getting ready for the resurrection and the rising of Antichrist. That's what the fifth trump's all about. Opening up that pit, the scorpions come out, Gog's in the ground at that time, being held by Hades in hell. But on that sixth trumpet, when Satan is thrown out of heaven to earth, he's going to resurrect this dead Gog into this Antichrist or this beast of the sea. And then when the seventh trumpet happens and we have that third attached soul, that's when our Lord comes back. And that happens on the seventh trumpet blowing in 15.1. Okay, and that these last three trumpets can only happen once. It's that simple. They can't constantly, you can't have multiple fifths, sixth, and seventh trumpets. It just doesn't work that way. And that's why he gives us this extremely important warning. And this is the key to understanding how to read this book properly. If you look at these last three trumpets with these last three additional woes attached to each, they can't reoccur. But if you go back up here and you look at that main set of chapters, you'll realize that they do occur. They occur, well, like I said, in Revelation 9, 1, 9.13, and 10 7 or i mean uh, 15 1 because that trumpet doesn't blow in 10 7. it tells you he does not blow that trumpet so when does that trumpet blow it actually blows in 15 1 when he releases those seven angels with the seven bulls and so you'll realize then that if you follow this pattern you'll realize that all three of those trumpets occur up here but you're going to see them reoccur in all these sub chapters mainly six and seven trumpet fifth trumpet not so much but they do reoccur constantly and so i went through all these different and this teaching here starts at the beginning of revelation and works through all of the chapters works through all of the transitions explains how the transitions occur why they're occurring how john's removed into three additional visions 
and how this all happens and it goes from the beginning of Revelation to the end and like I say I'll try to make a video of this um, over time but I found the com it's complex to put it in a video but yet if you follow this pattern up here of these 14 main chapters and read them in order and then add these additional layerings to the main chapters you'll realize that it's a simple concept in general but it takes a lot to explain it so that people can understand what I'm talking about. So those are the things that I've been working on. Um, a couple things that I want you to be aware of. We've had a third comet go through. I've not had time to add these to the timelines or um, the flow charts. Um, it's called Neowise. It's the third comet since like March, April. Um, it's flying over us now. Uh, I believe it is the last warning before we see um, a huge spike in the virus uh, as we walk into fall. And I think this then connects me to the images and the dreams that I've been having lately. And so I'm going to sort of go through um, what those two dreams are and what they might mean. Um, I do think they're important, and when I get these kind of dreams, they do seem to matter a lot of times. So, the first dream is what I call an acceleration dream, uh, which means things are going to start ramping up or speeding up, um, and so we need to watch in the next four months four to six months as we move through flu season and and transition of sending the kids back to school and all these different things um, what's going to come up here in the near future and so the first dream um, is I'm sleeping I'm in a dead sleep I don't think I'm dreaming at the time I'm just asleep um, and I wake up and I realize I'm in a vessel. I'm not, in, I'm not necessarily it's a car. It's a vessel. It's speeding out of control. The engine is screaming and the thing's shaking. And I'm in the middle of it. And I, I jump out of bed because I, well, I think I'm in a car running out. I'm in a vehicle running out of control. And I need to figure out how to stop this thing. So I, I jump out of bed. And I'm stomping on the ground. And my wife looking at me going, really, guy? And I'm going, yeah, OK. Now I realize that I'm in a dark room. And I'm not in a vehicle. And everything's fine. These types of dreams usually mean that we're having an acceleration of things um, in the future, near future, usually. So this has only happened once in the near in the recent you know just recently in the last week or so and so I think things are going to ramp up but I I've had a second dream which um really is disturbing and I'm not sure I understand exactly what it means um this dream started out as one thing and it's it's transitioned into a larger dream. I don't know how to explain it. Um, I only saw the beginning of it, I guess, at the beginning. Um, I've had it m multiple times, dozens of times within the last uh, year or so. Um, it starts out as I see a silver ball. I'm, I'm sleeping again. Total, I'm not dreaming. I'm, I'm in a dead sleep. And then a ball about the size of a golf ball or a pinball or it's a metal silver ball from what I can, what I see. And I'm sleeping and then all of a sudden I'm, I wake up and I have a ball in my mouth. This, you know, ball, size of a golf ball, okay? It'd startle you too if you thought you had a ball in your mouth out of a complete sleep. And just as you wake up and you realize you have this metal silver ball in your mouth you've swallowed it okay so i'm 
I'm choking on this thing, and I'm I'm trying to decide whether I actually swallowed some, or maybe it's a tooth. You know, maybe a crown fell out. What is this thing that I'm swallowing? And for a while, I thought maybe it was a silent. You know, I'm trying to be silenced. You know, it's an, it has to do with the throat, and that due to that, that maybe that I don't. They don't. Somebody's trying to stop me from getting my messages out, or. Um, I'm being attacked for my testimony to God or the things I believe in. Um, hopefully it's not satanic, um, but it tends to be violent. So I don't think it's it's a, a benevolent in any way, shape, or form. But then I had that dream multiple times um, for the last year or so. It's, it's been going on for a while. But in the last month or so, it's morphed into a much greater dream. Um, so the ball gets placed in my mouth. I wake up. I realize I can't do nothing. I've swallowed this ball. I jump out of bed. I'm trying to decide whether I've actually swallowed this ball. And now that it's been doing it for so many times, I know that I haven't swallowed this thing. But it then changed because... It stopped there before, so I swallowed the ball, and then I realized, oh, I'm okay. You know, everything's fine. That it's not inside me, and that I'm I'm just dreaming. And so I, it's disturbing, and I probably can't go right back to bed. But then, you know, I do over time. This last bit was that the ball is placed in my mouth, and I swallow it. I jump up, and before I can do anything about the ball being swallowed or I even realize that I'm okay the ball then goes through me like a shot of a gun this thing goes through me it's such a fast event and it's like a bullet going through a thick glass where it shatters into millions of pieces and so everything from my throat down is shattering and it's turning into red blood at the same time so it's not like it's like fragmenting but then it turns into this this blood everywhere it's just it's 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 like a catastrophic failure at one time like everything's going to collapse and and one moment or we're going to find a pinnacle where we realize that this isn't going to end up being a good scenario and that we've ended up in a really bad place and the the reality is that this isn't going to get better and that we're actually in the sorrows and this is just going to domino down and and it i see between the virus that's happening out here the removal of the police um you know department's authority in the cities and now what we're turning them into almost like the judges era where we self uh you know uh, go in and uh, police our own communities and these are islamic communities a lot of times so this is going to be a sharia type law system and so our communities are breaking down and and we're starting to see massive rioting from everything um you know just just everything and people are just not using common sense out here on a lot of the stuff and and so we're going to see not only these outbreaks of these um secondary ways of coronavirus but then we're going to start to see potential collapse of the cities and you know if trump sends the troops in and it's just going to aggravate the systems that the, that the mayors and the governors should have already taken care of and controlled on their level and not had to go to the national level um and we can i don't want to get into the political side of this because that's not what it's about you have to control the madness and the white noise out of here or it will turn into chaos before it's done but this virus um that we're seeing um has a pattern that's forming and i've talked to you about this many times um you know this is what i went to school i'm not a virologist but i am a uh 
um, urban forestry with an ag science degree. My main discipline was animal and uh, plant diseases and control of those diseases in urban communities um, like the ones that I, I actually uh, worked in in uh, Chicago. And so the problem with the way it was dealt with when I first walked into these sittings was that the disease was out of control. And so we're talking in main case, um, the first real um, problem that we arose was the Dutch elm disease in the tree sectors of the cities of the urban forestries of, of Chicago. And we could control a lot of what was going on in our community, but we couldn't control what was coming in from the outlying communities. And so regardless of the programs that we placed into um, the city, uh, the village of uh, Winneka, we couldn't control the infusion of beetles and things from the other communities. And so no matter how much we fungicide uh, removed uh, disease trees or did surgical removals of compartmentalization of trees so that you cut them back to good material so hopefully the fungus wouldn't penetrate into the good part of the tree but then that caused its own problems because now you have an open system um, in the middle of uh, growing season and the beetles are rampant and so as long as the tree can maintain a proper tuger pressure and force the beetles out of the tree once they board in it covers the beetle pushes the beetle out and through that pressure then seals up that wound and forces the fungus out along with the bug and so the tree can somewhat fight through its own mechanism these attacks on itself but regardless of what we did we couldn't control the other neighboring communities similar to the states you know where the states have control over the virus but it's not a national control it's a state thing so each state's doing their own thing so we can't control the virus because we're not doing this systematically through a national effort and it's through the communities or the states or whatever and so this is never going to end up at probably being a good scenario so what we see are a pattern occurring we see an unlocking of like Memorial or the fourth and then we see an infection rate start to happen four to 14 days afterwards and then within that bracket of the four to 14 days we start to see the hospitalizations occur and that runs from about oh wherever the start of the four days to the third or fourth week we start to see major hospitalizations or spiking of the hospitalizations where we had the spiking of the infections the between the fourth and the 14th day you start to see then the infections and the hospitalizations between the fourth day and the third and fourth week and then what do we see mortality rates start to climb um, within that window also um, into the fifth and sixth week as we start to see the mortality rates start to hit and they start to document the actual death rates um, from these unlocking and so we see about a four to six week period where we see these chain of events occurring so we saw that during memorial day we're going to see it during the fourth of july we're into the 22nd so we're into about the third week so what's happening the um, you're seeing a um, uptick of the infections now. You're going to start to see an uptick of or a spiking of the hospitalization and the ventilization of people on the respirators. And then we're going to see a spiking in the next week to two to three weeks of the mortality rates. And this is going to transpire and compel us into fall. Now we're still in the first wave of this pandemic and we won't see the second wave until we hit flu season in like October, November, December. And what is going to happen, this is one of my fears, is that we talked about allowing the schools to come back into session and we're going to allow the children and the young people to go back to school. 
This is going to be a catalyst for catastrophe. So the young children go back to school, and yes, they may not be infected by the disease. Okay, they may be asymptomatic, or they may be symptomatic, and they may show sign, or they may not show sign, or they may not die from this disease because they're in a non-vulnerable group, and so it may be sort of like a super flu to them, if if at all. But they're going to infect the teachers. And they're going to go home during breaks and when they come back from school and they're going to infect their households and the people around them and some of these people with pre-existing conditions and older people and young child young young children that might be susceptible to this more so than these um you know 19 to 30 year old people 20 middle 20 people are going to affect them it will affect these other people and so you're going to unleash these things and about the time flu season hits and so we will see what we call a huge spiking this fall and the second wave is always a 10 to 20 times greater event than the original one and since we originally locked the original event down we never really saw how it affected the whole community if we hadn't and um, because we have locked it down we've contained it to a certain point but then we have these initial unlockings of Memorial 4th and then we're going to see one during uh, school season um, and sports that's another one you know we're going to allow the kids to go back and play sports and infect each other and then they're going to take it home and they don't care you know these these dorms um, you know and I, I I'm going to start going into some of this a little sooner than I wanted to but you go into these dorms this is like a cruise ship waiting to happen okay these are sm small micro incubators that are going to be super spreaders once they get unleashed and they're going to go out into the population and they're just going to spread the disease through everything. And if you think herd immunity is that great, that's awesome, but that is not a cure. It will never go away. This disease will never cease. It will always be out there. Even if they get a vaccination, it will always be around. Then the question will be is once they get a vaccination, whether you're going to take the vaccination because you don't want to be vaccinated due to whatever reason or the vaccination has to be given out once which we find is probably not going to be the case since the antibody resistance is leveling off quickly and dissipating and then due to that we're going to see this infection rate hit and even though these people may not be infected they're going to spread it all over the place and so then you're going to see that major spiking into December, January, February. And then by the time we get to spring, we could potentially see what I call a lightning bolt effect in the markets. And why do I say this? Because Trump's brought this economy up to an extreme amount in the over 29,000 plus on the markets. And what we're going to see is we saw that spike down when the corona hit. And then we've seen this move up again because the markets are back in the mid 2700s again due to hope and optimism of a drug in a first and second test which no one pays attention to because it's such a minimal amount of people that they're actually doing the tests on that they don't matter until you get into the third and fourth test where they actually actually take it out to the population and have a control along with the virus or vaccination or whatever they're giving these people and then they can determine whether there's adverse effects that are happening to these people and whether it's safe for the population so that they can do a master distribution and production of the of the the medicine so that then they can get it out to the population and then whether it's going to be a annual event where they have to inoculate you vaccinate you every year or it's a one and done thing which is never really the case it's like this is a flu but it's a super flu 
um, you know, so it's going to have to be done every year. And so then how do you regulate all these different aspects? But I said for a while, I don't believe in a V shape recovery. I don't believe in a U shape recovery. I don't believe it's going to be an L shape recovery. I believe it's going to look like a lightning bolt. You had Trump's economy come up. You had the virus bring it down. You had the markets bring it back up. And once they realize after, and I'm going to talk about this in the next little segment here, about all these defaults and these furloughs and all these things that are happening that are going to end up in a bad place as we start to see the second wave hit. And they're going to have to start to lock things down. And people aren't really seeing economic demand driven. And so we have demand destruction. And we will then start to see the markets just basically lose total traction. Because they are overinflated up here now. You know, you've in the last four months, you've taken a market that dropped down, you know, from 29000 to 20000 22,000 in that range and then mushed it back up to 27,500 or so in that middle ground and in the last few months just so that we see the second wave come in and we start to lock things down and we see this what I call lightning bolt effect and so I'm not sold on the V shape U shape L shape or even the flat line curve that this economy is going to turn around I believe that once we finally realize that things are not getting better and that the infection rates are starting to spike out of control, the hospitals are starting to fill back up and that the demand is not going to be there and the oil supply is going to be oversupplied and there's nowhere to put the oil and this is another realization as they start to bring OPEC back online that the demand is not going to be there, that this market will crash. And that will take us into spring. And what do we talk about spring? Started at Daniel 8 around June of 2021. So we're going to see this domino effect. We're going to see this lightning bolt hit. And it's going to drive the markets in the ground. And there's not going to be a whole lot we can do about this. So I think these things are important. Um, I believe opening these schools up is going to be a devastating effect on the United States. Um, I believe this is going to cause us a lot of problems in the near future. The next four to six months as we work into next spring of this next year, um, you know, you're starting to watch these major defaults. Um, and these, so now that we're in July, we're in what we call earnings season in the markets. And so this earnings season is where we start to make the profits for these companies so that they can start to, show guidance and what have we seen all the guidance of all these companies have gone away no one knows where their companies are going to be in the next year and so all guidance of most companies have gone away and so the markets right now do that there is no guidance in the markets whatsoever and we cannot value these companies properly due to the environment of the corona and we don't know what's coming we have what we call a devaluation of things and an inflation of others. So devaluation is of homes and other things that don't matter to survivability. And so what do we see? Defaults are going to start to happen as the stimulus checks start to run out at the end of the month. And they're now in the process of trying to figure out how to re-stimulate you with money so you can stay afloat until, well, we realize that it's probably not going to get any better as we work in the fall and then we're going to realize that we hit a stumbling block that we can't get over and a wall we're going to hit a wall and that wall is going to hurt and so as these default rates start to happen um, it's going to place us in a bad place and the banks are being a bad player here in some respects are being good because they're redoing loans to homes and things like that. And then so if you have a job and you're going to be able to maintain your job, we will write you a loan, give you a lower interest rate, which gives you a lower payment structure, which allows you to basically sustain and survive easier. But in most cases, a lot of these new loans 
are being wrote to a person that may not have a job in six or eight months or a car loan is another one you know they're selling a car to a person that may not have a job in six or eight months and so you're going to start to see all these defaults take place and these micro bubbles start to occur in multiple areas um, you know cars homes um, you're watching a lending bubble right now um, of credit of bad loans that are going out that are going to come back on the balance sheets of these banks because they're writing loans to companies that are putting money in place to hold furloughed workers together and hope that they can get their companies back up and running before they run out of resources and their loans run out before they go into bankruptcy which is what's going to happen you're going to see a large amount of defaults occurring and so we're going to start to see all these micro bubbles start to pop up and you have to watch the dollar strength against the other currencies and you got to watch all these different factors that are occurring you know like you know what's going to happen now that we've removed the consulate from houston uh, today and how that's going to affect the trade war and other things with China as there is no demand for these products. Um, and you starting to watch, you know, this demand wane again. We're going to start to see, um, you know, people just don't have the resources to go out and buy new cars, new homes and things like that without putting themselves in jeopardy. It's just that common sense. And if you have a job that's suspect and now you're watching major companies do major layoffs, you know, Wells Fargo's laying off people. All these major companies are laying off people. Um, these tech companies are laying off people. They're starting to realize that they don't have to do business as usual, that they can use a you know a smaller skeleton type crew have them work from home not necessarily even have to have them go in the office and they can skeletalize this down eliminate the higher paying jobs bring up the lower paying jobs restructure their business and i'm telling you businesses can say how much they care about their employees and they do but a business can't care about their employees if they don't exist anymore. And so the main concern of any business, if you're a good businessman, the main concern of any business is survivability of the business so you can sustain jobs and hold a status quo within your business so you can keep people in a good place. And I don't think that these loans are going to get this done and so what we're doing is we're placing these businesses and these companies and things into a very precarious situation in the sense that they are placing themselves into a debt trap and this debt trap that is allowing them to gain all this debt on their balance sheet will not be able to be made back through revenues and these companies will ba go bankrupt and default anyway and so you're going to see major spiking of defaults um, in the next six to eight months and this will drive the markets in the ground and then think about this so some of your sectors like tech or the nasdaq is driven by basically six to 12 companies that are basically drive those markets. Okay. So your Alphabets, your Teslas, your Amazons, your Microsofts, and a few names are what keeps that NASDAQ healthy. Okay. And you, what have you done? You watched the valuation of Tesla go way up. You've watched the valuation of Amazon go way up. There's a point of demarcation where this valuation is not sustainable anymore. And so these companies are overvalued at this point. And they can't maintain the, the sustainability of the profitability of this company. And so these markets will force these companies back down. So if you've bought beyond the store demarcation line of wherever this talk, this stock actually ends up settling down to, um, because they're living on 
on sneezes right now. I mean, just like the virus. You know, these first and second tests that they're coming out with, no one looks at these first and second tests because there's not enough dichotomy of people. The groups are small. They're like 10, 15, 30 people. And so they don't show us anything. They, they, they can't give us any real information to show how this drug is going to happen. So the first and second tests are just obsolete and really don't matter. They're just, they give us a view into what we might see if we put it on a major scale of a third or fourth test and actually introduce it into the population with a control substance so that we can see how it interacts between the two different groups and then we can take that data and determine whether it's harmful to the population it helps either eliminate symptoms or not necessarily cures it but it 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 stops the disease in that person and so we can build up a immunity to it to a certain degree and it, and then over time we can herd immunity through the whole population and, it's, and it does then become sort of like a normal flu um, with potential breakouts of bluponic plague or h1n1 or other types that we see um, and if we see those hot spots hopefully we can um, gain traction on them before they get out of hand. So all these things are occurring. Um, I think we're going to see an acceleration of, and like I say, that ball that went into my mouth, went down through my throat, you know, had that choking effect, and then that smashing of the structure below it, and it turned into fragments of glass that turned into blood. I believe is a destruction uh, or a potential problem for this country because what it's sort of telling me is I believe that we're going to lose our status um, similar to potentially what the Jewish people are going to lose in their Shemitah year next year in 2020, uh, 2021, 2022 during that Shemitah year where you see the fortunes of Israel fall and the rise of that Ottoman Empire you're going to potentially see um, especially with this destructive mode of them tearing down our history and things um, this ramping up into the election cycle and I'm so tired of people telling me that they don't want to wear a mask because it irritates their face and they breathe in carbon dioxide. You know what? It's a moral hazard issue. And if you're not willing to protect the other person, then when you stand in front of the book of life and you have to answer for your decisions while we're in to the sorrows and the birth pains and God's warning us that we need to pay attention to all these things that we should really really pay attention to these things and there's a parable that I think that we should look at and I'm going to sort of end on this so the parable I'm going to bring you to is about the ten virgins so we have five virgins that have oil and they're ready for the marriage and so they've done their preparations and they saw the marriage coming and we're talking about from the sorrows to the end of the story when their Lord comes back here people you're one of these virgins you either prepared enough oil to get from the beginning to the end when our Lord comes back and you can gain your crowns and rewards in the marriage of heaven to the earth or you didn't prepare and because you don't have enough oil, you won't make it to the end very well and you won't be ready for the marriage and you'll make bad decisions because you didn't have enough resources to get to the end. But this parable is extremely important because it tells us something at the end and he explains this to us. So this parable, the five that don't have the oil and the five that do have the oil. And these five that do have the oil, they're all ready to go and they're going to make it to the end. And they've done what they need to do to get to the end of the story and be with our Lord and have this marriage of earth to heaven and make it into the, the new kingdom. But these five haven't been prepared. They haven't listened. They haven't done anything and they don't care. They don't see the world in that way. They don't probably aren't religious in any way shape or form and so they haven't done anything and and so they're just living life as they normally would and they haven't done anything to prepare for the end or the end days 
because you will be here till the seventh trumpet. You are going to go through the sorrows, through tribulation, through the, the abomination, if we'll make it that far, to the seventh trumpet. So you're going to be here, and so you need to prepare, or you should be prepared, or you should be getting prepared. But these people didn't. These five virgins, they didn't prepare at all. And God says, well, why would these five that did prepare, why would they take their resources, their hard work, they listened to me, they did what they were told, they're ready to get to the end, they have everything ready. And they'll hold faith because they'll make better choices due to them being ready while all this other stuff hits out here. But they haven't prepared over here. These five haven't done anything. They haven't listened to me. They don't care. They don't know anything about me. They haven't been ready for the marriage. And so the marriage isn't going to happen for them. They're probably going to not get through the narrow door. And they're not going to get to heaven. It's that simple. And so these five will fail. But the parable is saying, listen. Even though you're a Christian, and you probably ought to be helping these five, you can't use your resources that you've prepared for your wedding to the marriage of our Lord and, and heaven and God and give them to these people so that you will be in a precarious place later and end up making bad decisions for you and yourself and your families and your people when you prepared properly and they didn't. And there's another parable that goes along with this. Why would you throw pearls at swine? This parable is there for a reason. You know, if you're talking to somebody and they just don't get it, it's like talking to a wall. I don't care if you could draw them pictures. They just don't see it and they are never going to get it. Why are you wasting your breath? They're never going to see it. They're never going to get it. It's, and you're just wasting energy trying to get them across the finish line when they're probably Canaanites and they don't have the seal of God anyway. When you should be talking to people that actually do have the seal of God and trying to get them across the finish line. And that way you're not wasting your breath and your time to try to get these people across the finish line when these five virgins over here didn't care enough to matter and they really didn't do anything why should you waste your time with them? You should waste your time with the people that do care. And so if you're going to spread your resources around and, you know, still have enough to get to the end of the story, then you maybe ought to produce those resources to people that actually do listen and have a clue. Um, another thing that we have to watch, um, just to finalize this video, is Erdogan is moving um he's now got an invasion in iraq um he also has a uh, potential talk of war between egypt and turkey as uh, there's a takeover for libya and so now we're talking about that 10 nation region of ezekiel 38 39 but erdogan is in the process of basically pushing the Kurds into Iran's uh, court. Once they align, we see that Daniel 8 effect of Turkey going over and crushing them both. You see that rising of that Ottoman Empire and how he's already being ordained as the uh, Muslim leader over there anyway. Um, he just shifted the museum in Turkey to a mosque and so we're starting to see this transformation of this caliphate and this Ottoman Empire that he wants to rebuild by 2023 and he will he will rebuild this by 2023 um, but like I said since he is the first horseman the white rider of Revelation um, He's that first seal that's going to start to bring the sorrow. Well, he already has. If he invaded on uh, Yom Kippur of last year on October 9th, he already started breaking those sorrows and, uh, and seals. And so we're going to start to see this ramping up, as I've explained on a number of my videos out there. So I just wanted to go over some of these things. Um, I do see a ramping up. I see a potential catastrophe in the next few months occurring in this nation as we get into an election cycle and we see the um, 
progressive basically destroy this country and rip our history and our monuments down as they're trying to get a um, change in the method of our leadership and I go back to I believe that we will see Trump re-elected um, if you go back now we go back to the hundred year Ottoman destruction of when we started to see World War I um, finished and the Ottoman Empire dissolved and if you look at that cycle of presidents, we saw Woodrow Wilson as the president back in 1916. He had done two terms, and then he couldn't run a third term, so we had an elected Republican come in. And so I'm hoping that history repeats itself, and we don't get a Joe Biden as a president because if you get a joe biden as president you might as well have nancy pelosi as your president because she pulls his strings and she is will then become the speaker of the house and she will be actually the president and biden will just be the puppet at that point um, but i don't want to get too political and you may agree or disagree with that view um, but you know biden came out the other day and and started to praise the Islamic communities and how we had to embrace these communities. So if you believe in an antichrist radical Islamic beast system, I'm guessing that you probably don't want to vote for this guy. Um, but I'm going to end it on that. Keep an eye on some things. I believe the uh, second wave is going to hit um, within the next few months as we start to open these schools up and start to um, herd immunity the community so that they can spread it out uh, around the, the rest of the country and, and uh, basically put the weaker groups of populations at risk. So um, realize that you got to repent. There's a short, narrow door a thin door to walk through and that's only one way and that's through the lord jesus you have to believe in the lord jesus to get through that door the jews need to come back to the sun or they can't get to heaven so we need to bring that community through that door also and we need to get the uh, jewish community to understand that this this jesus this son of god was not just a man or a prophet that he is the open door and this is the only way to heaven but we are going to go through some dramatic changes in the near future we have to keep our eye on the end game and that is the ultimate goal and that's to get to heaven into the into the uh, new kingdom and so we can't look at the flesh we have to look at the spirit at this point and realize that the flesh will go away and it's all about the spiritual body and how to get your spiritual body through the threshold to the uh, to the new kingdom so god bless everybody and have a great day thank you so much